sure. but where it will be infallibly and irrefutably valuable is going to go up with the more services you have. So if you're saying, so Cole, would you start with one then? Yes, because I like to over-engineer stuff. <laughs> Welcome everybody back to the DevSec Voice. Today we have Cole Morrison here to talk about using a service mesh. Uh, Cole has worked as a software lead and DevOps engineer and SaaS, IoT, social, network, social networking and education tech companies for the past decade. Having worked in companies of all sizes, he has a keen interest in exploring new tools, markets, technologies, and the business strategy surrounding them. So he's, you know, a, a jack of all trades, a renaissance I, man. I can act like I put a lot of thought into it. <laughs> he's, I did not he's also spoken at large industry conferences. I was like, oh, like AWS I haven't seen reInvent, place out Google there. Next, Microsoft Bill, and HashiCom. Uh -huh. And he currently works in the tech. Did you have tech on the brain, or were you just kind of like new front infrastructure, networking, Both. and security? <laughs> so welcome, Cole. Thank you very much. Thank you for the welcoming. And I, the, you know, like the way that you, you introduced me there was so much more elegant than like when I was trying to, to write out the description, I was like, cause in my head, I'm hearing it in this, like not nearly as, as, as well spoken. So <laughs> you need a hype person when you metaphorically get on stage, you know what I mean? And it's just something yeah. to like lift those words off the page, be a little yeah. less corporate. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're super stoked to have you here. We're, we were glad to, to have you refer to us. Um, your career history is really impressive. And, uh, I know you're going to be an excellent guide on service meshes for our community today. Uh, especially <laughs> given our last conversation, right? Yeah. Um, so, so I'm just going to go ahead and dive in. I love yeah. starting by just talking a little bit about the person uh, that we're hosting here. Yeah. Um, what if you tell everybody a little bit about this career journey to eventually getting to uh, being a senior developer advocate? What did those milestones look like for you? Yeah, that's a, it's always, I like, I mean, really talking to anyone in the tech industry is always an interesting, interesting path, but um, specifically for people that I find in developer relations, developer advocacy, really anything engineering focused the the journey they get there it's always interesting that that i almost feels like half and half will be kind of the traditional path whereas like the other half will be like i have no idea how that even <laughs> up like that. you know what i mean right which, which i was certainly one of those people so like i was formally trained in economics and marketing i thought i was going to go into insurance of all wow. things okay no I know, but my uh, mentor was big into entrepreneurship. It was the early 2010s, you know, uh, the, the social network. Do you remember that movie that came oh, out? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that was a good one. Yeah, all the startups were there. I was like, what am Inspired I Inspired you or? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll call it that. That's a lot more elegant than what, <laughs> than what happened. And I'm like, I'm like ready to go to some like camp for this stuff. And I'm like, I can't do this. I should, I should tech <laughs> and I should. <laughs> I should do a, I should do a startup. I should, I should do that. So, um, I got kind of lucky, uh, in the sense that I got to meet Brad Feld from TechStars, who really okay. kicked off my like uh, tech career, giving me the opportunity to work with him, get to know a bunch of the people in the tech space. And that translated into some different engineering work for startups. I got to do touch the whole stack, front end, back end, DevOps, eventually leading a uh, very, very, very small team in context of those tech startups where I started doing everything infrastructure. And then eventually uh, I decided I was gonna just start blogging and teaching what I knew because you and I both know one of the most frustrating parts of being a developer is reading documentation. I didn't know where you were going with that. <laughs> yeah, or lack of documentation, right? right? And, yeah. and it becomes this, so, when in college, I had I had like two jobs. So one of them was was being an economics tutor, right? And the other one was being in a cover band. So you can see like all Whoa. that stuff there. Oh I my know. gosh! So I was like, let's take this to the tech. Maybe I can explain this a little bit better. I started putting out blogs. Those started taking off, and that's kind of how I how as things went on, I started putting out my own courses. Like, oh hey. Is there any type of job that sort of does this? And hey, developer advocacy is that neat sort of like experts, expert nexus point where you have these people that come from engineering, but but do want to get up and speak about it, talk about it. And uh, then I met uh, Erica here and the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, as you were, that career journey was so interesting that like, I, I kept wanting to be like, I want to talk about this more and, and um, wow. <laughs> So, okay, before I ask the, the more important question, is your cover band like on YouTube or is this like a secret cover band oh. like we're no longer talking about? Oh yeah, this was, this was back in, this was back in college. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we did like all this stuff and, um, 
I, I would not dare link to the public. Okay, all right. Of that. <laughs> I just, no blast from the past. So what yeah. was really interesting about what you said too is, uh, you know, I also, you know, part of my career held from startup world, running mm -hmm. one, being a part of one. And I agree with you. I think it adds so much to your tech career. You're, you're forced to put on so many hats. And, and I feel like I'm running a startup sometimes as a developer advocate. I oh, mean, yeah. you, you're in a, in a way some sort of uh, autonomous being. I don't know if that's the best way to put it. Um, Actually, I think you described it really well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great way to put it. You you are constantly getting feedback from an audience. Yep. You generally have to kind of figure out what the specific problem is. You know, of course, the nice part is you're not bootstrapping it. You, you, you hopefully, <laughs> yeah. hopefully you've got a company budget that's like, oh, it will help you and some some other people. Right. So it's not as as and not managing people. anyone either. Yeah, yeah. But the startup ecosystem, you're right, because it forces you to understand the entire view. Whereas, you know, if, if, if you go the very strict engineering path, which uh, I know, if, at least from our conversation, we've both done, um, that has a massive amount of benefits. You talked about specialization and how, how important that is from a professional standpoint. Uh, you know, there's no wrong path. They all lead to, to good things, so. Absolutely. No, I 100% agree. Um, and, and I know from our last conversation, uh, we grew up in sort of the same area, <laughs> right? So the... Uh, yeah. I think you're calling it the tri-state area, but the Southern Ohio, Northern Kentucky area, which, you know, is not necessarily known for, for tech careers. And, you know, here you are with this highly successful tech career. Um, what advice do you have for people who want to follow in your footsteps? Uh, trying not to throw down a bunch of self-deprecating humor right now. So I would really... <laughs> I mean, that's, and that's more than welcome. I love self-deprecating as long as there's like actual advice in there. Yeah. Whenever someone's asking me for stuff like that, I'm always like, you know, and then I'll like give my whole song and dance and I'll say, but don't listen to me because what do I know? Like, I can totally wrong. So humble. Oh, I mean, but but in all in all seriousness, there's just sort of that recognition, the, the recognition as you get, as you get older, you want to believe so many things that you've done or self-made right mm -hmm. but then when you look back you recognize wow there were a lot of things that that were just lucky for me so for me i took a huge risk to just move out to the west coast i didn't really i, I can act like i put a lot of thought into it i did not put a lot of thought <laughs> into it i was like oh i haven't seen a place out there i'm gonna just sign a lease without seeing it i'm gonna just uh -huh. go because i want to see was this for tech did you have tech on the yeah. brain or were you just kind of like new frontiers both <laughs> okay yeah it was for a startup, which at the time when you're like early 20s feels a lot more stable than it does when you're <laughs> in your 30s and, you're, yeah, and you realize yeah. like this could go poof. Um, so very impulsive uh, in terms of doing and doing that. But I would say just in general technology, the entire nature of it, even from an economic standpoint, is a lot riskier. It does move a lot faster and therefore it kind of lines up with the mental models. If you're going to try to follow a path in technology, you do have to be willing to accept some level of risk and take some sort of jump, right? Um, yep. Because the formal path into technology, your journey, Erica, into technology, when you learn software development, like doesn't matter how formal your education was, we both know breaking into it is an entirely different story, right? Mm -hmm. it, takes you, it requires to take a lot of big steps that can sometimes seem like bad decisions, like saying, yeah, I'll go work at a discount at the startup, right? So. Uh -huh. Or things <laughs> you don't know how they're gonna turn out. I mean, it's, it's not a career of, I don't know if you wanna say certainty, you know, there's a lot of jobs and all that, but I mean, it's constantly evolving and I think even risk taking throughout the career of, okay, you know, I, you know, for instance, with AI being the new hype, right? Like people making yeah. that skill transition, there's constantly new skills to be acquired, you know, new methodologies for doing things. Um, so yeah, I think the curiosity and the risk taking that you mentioned is a, is a huge part of it. That's a really good one too, curiosity, like very, very much so. Cause um, I remember having a conversation with my mentor at the time and he was just like, in that time, because it's early 2000s, he was, he was like a lot of folks that I run into nowadays, especially when they're in a new career. And again, this was when startups were everywhere. Y Combinator was everywhere. Who's just uh -huh. like, are you trying to be an engineer or an entrepreneur? Like decide which one. Mm -hmm. One leans into that curiosity more and just deeply learns, you know, goes on to the discipline track of mastering the craft, whereas the other is, you know enough, you get the problem done, you take it there. So I don't know how we got onto that topic, but. No, it's okay. No, I was gonna say that's a great point too. Again, as yeah. someone who did sort of the entrepreneurial thing is, 
you know, I left uh, my job at one point because I wasn't being challenged. I decided I was going to make apps, right? Yeah, and uh, you know, I had a really great mentor who was like, "That's not how business works. You don't just make shit and then sell it, right?" Yeah. And so, you know, as I went along that path, I was like, "Oh, I'm a business person now. I'm doing product market fit analysis, and I'm doing yeah. sales, and I'm actually not engineering anything." <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's how it goes. And you're like, "Oh, where did it go right? Where did it go right?" <laughs> yeah, but no, I, uh, I, I think that. Uh, there, there is an, in a, a different type of innovative spirit amongst engineering. And I'm, I'm personally glad to be back here. I think the developer advocate kind of, to kind of tie that up. I think the developer advocacy is just enough of that engineering technical skill spirit combined with me. <laughs> I'm going to communicate this. I'm going to, in a way, sell this to people, um, the people skills aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we don't sell stuff. We tell the truth. <laughs> I mean, I, I tell the yeah. truth, but yeah, yeah, I think it's like true. selling excitement. I don't know. If, I don't know if you feel that way at all, but I like to elicit <laughs> excitement in the communities. And I think yeah. I feel like sometimes that's a sell, especially to engineers, because yeah. engineers can be very hard hitting sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. No, I, I feel you on that. <laughs> but thanks. Thanks for the uh, for the lowdown on, on how you got here and, you know, yeah. all your wisdom. Um, Jumping into the topic, uh, yeah. service mesh, right? So mm -hmm. um, service mesh, the concept of a service mesh is going to be hugely useful to the community. It's going to be a new concept for a lot of us. It's fairly new to me as well. Mm -hmm. um, so could you explain to us in simple terms what a service mesh actually is and what kind of problems you're trying to solve? Yeah. All right. So let's, let's do the developer advocacy full transparency. When I saw this question, to explain in simple terms what service mesh is, I, I kind of laughed. I was like, oh, this is gonna be this is gonna be a tough one because it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's you know, there's no uh, I'm not quizzing you here. I'm not gonna oh, like, yeah, yeah. Awkward, but it was more just I was looking at kind of like the the almost irony of of how complicated networking can be and everything inside of yes. it and boiling it down. So I, I actually did come up with with a way to do it and um, I think the there's so many moving pieces and complexities. I think the actual best place to start is with an analogy and just say, let's just start there because otherwise it, there's so many potentials for rabbit holes. If we go direct, because I, I know that we're going to talk about the tech afterwards, we will just fall down into wonderland and it will not be, it won't be fun for anybody yet. So let's say, so let's, to go simply put, um, let's, I guess this is the metaphor because I'm not using the word like, right? I think that's the differentiation. Um, oh, a simile and a metaphor, yeah. Yeah, something like that. I, yeah. I was not. <laughs> okay, so uh, you have your services, your applications, right? We're going to look at these like houses, businesses, buildings. These are physical locations, okay? So for whatever reason in this world, we're going to look at this little mini town. This is your, mm -hmm. your, your landscape, your infrastructure, your architecture. For some reason, there's no postal delivery service at all, all right? If this is the case for these, any, any one of these, these locations to communicate, they're going to have to come up with their own ways to move messages, move packages between each other, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's start there. If we start there and you've done from scratch development, if you've done greenfield development, or if you've come into a place that's brownfield, even though this seems far-fetched for uh, like how any modern town or something would work, from an application standpoint, this is, this is pretty common, especially greenfield. It's like, I've got multiple applications we've made. How do I make them communicate with each other? Well, mm -hmm. we wind up home baking the communication schemes. Maybe we're we're leaning into, you know, just it's just layer seven pretty well, controlling everything with some layer four firewall rules or something like that. But either way, we're doing a lot to make sure that the communication fits the way that we needed to, that those applications needed to. This becomes even more absurd as we add more and more locations and buildings in this analogy here. So a service mesh, very simply put, is that postal service, right? That is what it adds to this sort of fictional architecture. Instead of everyone in these businesses needing to, and buildings and residences needing to think, okay, how do we communicate with this person, this person, this person? We're gonna all just put it in a mailbox. That's gonna go from my mailbox to theirs and they're gonna get it. 
Now, from this analogy, we can actually learn a lot about what a service mesh does just by looking at what a postal delivery service does. We need a standardized way for all communications to go between everything. They're all now secure, relatively, far more than how we were doing it before. Um, we get a lot of, of observability because the postal headquarters is able to see and have a view into everything mm -hmm. that's going on. And of course, onboarding new locations, new businesses, new residences is way easier than it was prior, right? So uh, that then is my like nutshell sort of like understanding of what a service mesh is. So um, I do have another piece there, but before I go into that, was that was that pretty good? Did that work? Yeah, you, you know, I think that the postal service analogy really resonates with our network engineering folks because we love talking about postal services and all of our, <laughs> our analogies. Um, so so the benefits of, of this are that it's more secure, it's more observable. And in a way, it sounds like it's almost, um, I don't know if you want to say more standardized, but it's easier oh, it to is. continue onboarding new applications because we're doing it a specific way. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just like that's, that's why when I was thinking, I was like, gosh, the postal, a postal delivery service is such a good idea in terms of what it does. Because the funny part is, is like all the stuff I've talked about, let's standardize communication. Let's make sure that it's not been tampered with, right? As things go, let's have all these other things. These are all problems. If you think about it, you're going to have to solve whether you use a service mesh or not, you're just uh -huh. going to wind up figuring it out. So this a service mesh then becomes both a set of technologies in a standardized way to uh, and tried and true way uh, to get these problems solved that people have gone ahead and thought about. So sure. that's 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 the one aspect I will. And I'm going to ask you because, again, I, I originally thought we had less time. There is a second piece to this, and that's something that I, I would, I'm sure everyone in the, in the networking community is aware of, and that's service discovery. Um, mm -hmm. That tends to, some of the service mesh products have those built right in with it. Oh. Right? And some just leave it to the side and let the, the whatever other runtime they're using uh, do it. So um, service discovery is something that, for example, in HashiCorp console, our service uh, mesh product, our networking product, you can just use the discovery piece or you can use the mesh and the discovery. And the discovery, what that does is it allows your different, your different applications to start thinking in terms of identity. So um, mm. if you've got, you know, a shipping service and a, and a, and a, and a what payment service, right? Um, and each of those services have instances of itself behind it. So you've got like four shipping apps, you know, four payments app. They all do the same thing. Instead of thinking about what IP address do I go to, what load balancer do I specifically hit, all of them get a phone book that just says, oh, hey, you need shipping? All right, the service discovery is going to grab it, get a healthy one, send it back, right? Uh -huh. This is obviously going to be a very critical piece, an important part of service mesh. So um, you're going to have ones like, so for example, like Istio and Kubernetes, they just leverage as far as I know, the Kubernetes service discovery, as opposed to like rolling uh, their own. But yeah, so that's the service discovery piece, though. I don't really think uh, I mainly mentioned that because if you're wondering how all of these things discover each other, um, generally that functionality comes with the mesh, whether it's like, you know, a la carte or something that's just with it. So. Okay. Yeah, no, no, that's worth noting. Um, so, so I guess diving just slightly deeper into your your fantastic simple analogy here, <laughs> really work like okay, we've got a postal service, right? Where we're we're packaging up the way that we're going to communicate between these applications. Like, can yeah. you break that down a little more for us? Yeah. So I guess I guess dive into like the technical side of it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now that we have this, this is way easier to 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 branch off and speak of the tech because otherwise. Like it, it can just feel a little bit weighty, right? Because yeah, when I say, you have to well, have a frame of reference, like a big picture. <laughs> yeah, because when I say this next part and I don't lead with the postal service paradigm, it's gonna be like, wow, this fail feels like a lot just to do what you're doing. The the postal service headquarters is going to be the control plane. This is going to be its own set of servers, its own set of applications that are running and exist to give this functionality. That's mm, kind okay. of a, that, that's the best way to think about it. They're going to oversee everything happening in this mesh here. So that's part one. That, but the other part is, of course, going to be the, the mailboxes and the actual delivery itself. Those are going to be, that's going to be the data plane. Those are going to be your proxies, okay? And then, of course, all the work they're doing both in between each other and to the actual uh, control plane itself. So in a nutshell, how this winds up working, when you have a mesh in place, pre-mesh, we have like your shipping app and your payments app. They're going to talk to each other directly or through, mm -hmm. from one to a load balancer. From this point on, this is where it changes quite a bit. Now, 
shipping will always go through a proxy that will then go through payments proxy and then go into the app itself, right? And okay, that's how yeah. all communication will happen. And obviously if, if you're if you're into infrastructure and optimization, that's like, oh wow, that's quite a bit. So you mean every single one of these is gonna be going between proxies and going up to the to the, uh, the mesh? Well, depending upon the mesh you, you pick, this the communication isn't that big of an overhead. So for example, uh, console will use the gossip protocol. So they're always like, anytime something happens, it sort of spills through uh, the entire mesh itself slowly so that everyone's always up to date as opposed to doing some crazy up to the center and back. And obviously uh -huh. there's a lot of fail safes to make sure that that works okay. Um, hey, hey, puppy. <laughs> <laughs> Great purities. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, those are the two main pieces, but did you have any, any like thoughts on that? Um, no, so again, I, I, I love the way you're explaining it because you're putting it in terms that, again, at least with my Cisco background, I'm like, oh yeah, okay. I, I'm familiar with like a controller and a data plane. Um, <laughs> so what does that look like in terms of setting up a service mesh? Like you, you mentioned that there are different types. I mean, is this, mm -hmm. um, I guess very beginner friendly in order to set up like the controller or like, I don't know, can you get a little more into what that looks like? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> I mean, as much as you think would not overwhelm people because oh. you're, you're, you're the sensei guiding here. Yeah. Oh no, no. I just, I just, it's funny. Cause this plays into a later question about like, um, obstacles and uh <laughs> oh and so it's an obstacle no no no. we should we should definitely talk okay about it. we should definitely yeah <laughs> um in terms of setting it up interestingly enough the compass that i've given the, the is, is sort of it right you're going to set up this separate service that's what it is you're going to have to think mm -hmm. about scaling it just like any other service and for every one of your existing applications you're going to need to give them access to this data plane to this proxy, and you're gonna have to register those with them. Um, mm -hmm. Now, how you go about doing that's gonna differ between service mesh, it just is, right? You're gonna have some configuration you're gonna need to write for the actual servers themselves, so the control plane itself, and then on each proxy, you're gonna have some specific configuration as well as registering the applications and of course telling them to start sending traffic to the proxy as opposed to outwards. Now, some of those can get okay. away with that by reworking the internal DNS of whatever node that they're on to just catch it so you don't even have to change the application at all, but you are going to need to make some changes there. The other thing you're going to have to think about is, of course, the networking rules, making sure the communication and all the right ports are open between both the control plane, the data plane, and everything else that needs to happen there. And all those things are kind of standard though, right? For introducing yeah. this to any type of any type of brownfield environment, or if you're doing greenfield, you're probably already in the trenches uh, setting all of these different things up as it is. That is it from a high level. The tricky part, of course, becomes, well, I, you know, my stuff's split between on-prem and a cloud provider, or it's mm -hmm. split between multiple cloud providers, right? Or, you know, it's, it's all internal or some things are public. You know, when you start going to those things, there are solutions for how you can figure those, but that's gonna be kind of on a case-by-case -case basis in terms of what you'll need to do to get all those things to work. Uh, once sure. all that stuff's set up, obviously you get to, to move into like the second day operations where you can, of course, start using the mesh to implement some different things. Uh, but from a, what is it from a high level you need to do to get it set up? That's, that's what it is. So, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and like you said, I don't think that that's a, a crazy amount of setup, as, again, especially from an infrastructure or network engineering background. But I mean, in your experience, um, are there developer environments and companies where it is more specialized and that's a real disconnect? Like, is this something that typically like DevOps or another team is doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. The, where this is going to be difficult is always going to be the massive sprawling brownfield environments where people have already set up very specific networking rules, right? Because where mm -hmm. we tend to, from, from the networking perspective, control access even though there's standards of where that should happen, sometimes those get mixed and matched. Which layer are we controlling it at? Which layer are we cutting off access for? Um, how are we dealing with, you know, geographic 
uh, connections mm -hmm. and things like that. If you have very specific business logic tied to the networking, which hopefully you don't, that's obviously going to add a complication in terms of adding something new, like a service mesh in and a configuring it. But for the most part, and this is what I love about service mesh, is the reason that's, that, that's nice about a proxy, right? If you add this in, the whole goal of that service mesh is to be very undisruptive to the application developer. Mm -hmm. The only thing changes you should really need to make to the app is just, just go through the proxy. Like That's it. Go through the proxy. Just call all of your services by name. And, and you're done. You don't have to think about it. So, yeah. And this isn't just a matter of, of convenience at the sacrifice of performance, right? There are no performance sacrifices by implementing a service mesh or a little bit. Um, yeah, you tell there's, me. there's, there's a, there's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. Cause if you, you, if you're in networking and everything, like, then you know that as soon as we start adding proxies between everything, there's going to be some sort of performance hit. And um, this, uh, I think I think later on, there this kind of comes into the, the obstacles thing as well. It depends <laughs> upon the, uh, it depends upon the needs of the, of your applications. It's something to really question because again, we're looking at the trade-off of speed in a different sense of, mm -hmm. hey, I can add a new application very quickly. It can be secure, it can be observable. We can, you know, can have complete control over it versus adding some milliseconds of latency. Now, if you're like doing e-commerce, you know, you're probably not gonna care. It's gonna, the trade-off is gonna be very, very, very simple place. The only place where I've seen, okay, let's, let's really think about this is um, I've done some work in the real-time multiplayer gaming space. Mm, okay, right. yeah. Yes. And so as soon as I say that, you all know that 10 milliseconds of latency in a oh, real-time game. Oh yeah, it matters. <laughs> so it's in that in that cases in those cases where we got to shave off as much as possible to where well it depends what is the value of those extra, you know, 10, 20, 50 milliseconds. Is that make or break? If it is, well then I mean you're probably thinking about a lot of other things that you're scraping off in terms of mm -hmm. network connectivity and performance as well. Uh, but we can we can go more into that now or we can also uh, I was going to say uh, so the, it sounds like the answer is a, sort of it depends like everything in technology right all of your yeah, technical yeah. person it depends and and yeah. I want to come back to you know when does that matter um yeah. later but uh sure. just because we're you know also a security podcast could you touch on how a service mesh supports a security posture yeah absolutely so let's go with uh probably the most obvious first here. And this is um, one of the one of the like immediate benefits, especially if I'm talking to a developer, I'm like, hey, do you have mutual TLS set up across all of your services? And they're usually like, no. <laughs> it's like, it's like, okay, well, I was, it was, I was kind of a trick question. I was kind of like, you know, leading you uh, with Wow, it. I feel like I'm a little arrogant. <laughs> Yeah, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, well, it's like, yeah, but they're all locked in, in an internal network. So, you know, why yeah, should I yeah, care? Yeah. It's, like, it's like, well, you know, good point. You know, no one's going to get through the brick wall. But if you're on a cloud provider, that's perhaps a bit of a different story. If sure. you're, those services are communicating over from cloud provider on-prem, that's also a different story, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's also the fact that, you know, if someone does crack into your network, they're not gonna tell you, you're not gonna know until like it's too late, right? Um, right. <laughs> uh, so um, when we went, went back to, okay, everything now, instead of going app to app goes proxy to proxy. One of the mm -hmm. biggest first, oh, wow, that's awesome benefits of a service mesh is mutual TLS between everything. Because now mm -hmm. the applications are going between proxies and for almost all of the service mesh options, I know for console, of course, absolutely, it's gonna have its own certificate that creates different leaf certificates for all of the different proxies so that they can both, of course, you know, authenticate, authorize, and then of course, secure the traffic or secure the, uh, yeah, the, the communication between all applications now. This means any new application you add and set up with the service mesh, you've got mutual TLS set up. Now, obviously there's the encryption benefits of the communication, we want that, but since 70 plus percent, I love the stat, breaches are because of misconfigurations, this takes a lot of that chance of Cole just forgetting or messing up a cert or subject name uh -huh. or whatever. And, and suddenly there's a lot more peace of mind there. So that's like one of the first right. sort of just sort of obvious benefits. 
Um, the second thing though, and, and obviously there's a lot, but I'm going to just try to stay to three here is centralized yep. layer four, layer seven control. You can obviously implement those from a firewall perspective, from an application level, but since the proxies are sitting in front of all applications and you've got the, the control plane up, you can set those controls there. You can say, okay, shipping should no longer be able to contact uh, social comments at all. You just set that in the mesh, goes through all the proxies, you're not gonna do anything else. Now, I know some security people are gonna be like, well, you still gotta make sure that the ports, the firewalls are, are tightened and all that stuff. Of course you do. But since everything's going through a proxy now anyways, you, you're just locking it down to the proxy. So we know with certainty that we have locked that down. Mm -hmm. So there's the layer four, obviously that one's pretty, that's not as difficult to set up, but there's also layer seven. You can say, okay, maybe payments can contact uh, the social comments, but only these specific endpoints. You can set those rules up and let it go through there. There's also stuff like, um, Think about a large service oriented architecture where you've got like 50 different services that roll up into one user facing application mm -hmm. and you need to just test version two of social comments. This is always a very interesting problem. When you're running a monolith, we just test the entire version two, right? Uh -huh. say, did it work or did it not? But in that type of architecture, how do you deal with it? What are you going to replicate everything again, just to test yeah. one thing? That's certainly one way, but something else a mesh can do with all of these very simple to configure centralized rules is you can say, let's do some service splitting. Let's split 10% of the traffic off to this new version two. Let's watch it. Let's make sure that it's working. And then as that goes, we can split it off there. There's also oh, that awesome. same, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, we had a, a talk at one of our previous conferences, one of the HashiComps, where they did a full architecture of how they do these micro review apps in terms of just doing these little bits of splits to make sure that it's working that way. You can get a true QA test uh, and dealing with the problem of large service uh, or service running or architectures. Um, but there's also other simple benefits of like, well, let's say you've got 50 instances of a shipping service. Great, spread across all different types of geolocations, all right? How do you treat, how do you tell your payment service to use the one closest to it? Mm. How do you say, go to the one in my data center, the closest possible versus all the way out in Europe, just for networking costs? Well, you can, of course, use a service mesh to make those things happen too. Um, that's, I feel like I just departed from security there. So let's bring it well, back. Well, that's okay. I mean, I, yeah. I, I love all the benefits. So you're, you're really selling me here. So I was just letting <laughs> you go. Yeah. Don't worry, we'll we'll make it sound very grim here soon enough. But um, oh, no. <laughs> but that, but the other thing is going back to um, that like that layer four, layer seven control. How do you know what's going on? Well, again, the observability and the metrics you're going to get across the entire mesh is going to play you know massively into any type of auditing that you need to do. You're going to be able mm -hmm. to debugging, right? Seeing where things have gone wrong. You're going to see what's going where at all times. And this, of course, having that centralized location, both for, you know, the, like we said, encryption, TLS between services, all the different control across the network and seeing across of it, that in and of itself, again, less misconfigurations. If we can get rid of that low hanging fruit to 70%, we're like, we're like off to the races, right? So. Sure. No, and I mean, even, even with security, I feel like a lot of times, a question I've got at Cisco is like, oh, you know, these products do the same thing essentially, or like, how do you choose a product or, you know, why use a service mesh to control traffic at layer four when you use a firewall? But it's we're really talking about layered security, right? Mm -hmm. And and kind of the impression I got from what you just said is, you know, security closer to the source. So mm -hmm. it's centralized, but also closer to the source. Is that like what you described it? Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a really good way to put it. Um, I guess I, I think I kind of lost myself and I was just like, man, I really don't want to tinker and set these rules up in 50 different places. Like, <laughs> yeah. no, you're right. You're right. <laughs> right. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think illustrating for people sometimes, like, especially when it comes to firewall, like I can do it, it, firewall can do anything. Right. Um, so that yeah. was a great explanation of it. Um, and, and since you deviated a little bit from security, I'm going to just pick and, and, and ask, are there other benefits that you feel like? or a must know for anyone considering a service mesh? Mm, let's see. Um, yeah, so this is uh, actually, yes, this is actually a really big one. This is, first up, if you're a developer, and at least for me, because I know, Erica, you also came from software development, um, you say the concept of service mesh, and, and mm -hmm. suddenly, like, 
especially if you've got any bit of like the entrepreneur's type, like, oh, this is how you'd scale this, right? This is uh -huh. how you not have to worry about ad hoc networking rules everywhere. Yep. There's also the benefit of you pick the right service mesh. You can also use any runtime that you want as well. This is to me very important because obviously yeah. containers are, you know, they do a lot. Uh, they're, 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 they're great. Some of us are still using bare metal. I'm, I'm not using bare metal. Well, there's nothing wrong with bare metal. I don't know why I said that like that, but bare metal, virtual machines, containers, you pick the right service mesh and you can unify all of them in this one networking model, right? You get all these benefits no matter where it is. And suddenly you've got something to deal with legacy, like modern future, mm. and you get the same sort of interface and hearing that is the same reason I kind of started loving containers in general, because it allowed uh, a lot of development teams to kind of go in a polyglot fashion, right? To say, you write your app what you want, I'll write mine what I want, let's get everything in order, you know, in the same way sure. you run it where you want, and we'll still be able to talk, so, yeah. Yeah, no, no, it makes sense. Um, so I, there was a, oh, okay, next question. Yeah. So we got a lot of information, right? Um, we know a lot about what a service mesh is, both at a high level, a little bit deeper, um, mm -hmm. the security aspect of it. Um, but how does someone know, yeah, it's time to implement the service mesh? Is it, is this just one of those things where as long as, you know, you're not, you know, developing a multiplayer game that you are like, hell yeah, let's, let's get that service mesh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Interestingly, that was my thought when I first learned about it. I was like, oh, I'm going to do this right now. <laughs> When you, when you um, have a hammer, everything is a nail, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Except in this case, it's more like a, you know, a, a jackhammer and, um, oh, man. not the, not to take away from it. But thing is, is, is the question that, that I want to ask if, when you're considering a service mesh is how many services do you have? How many are you adding and taking away rapidly? Here's the thing mm -hmm. is if you've only got a three tiered application, so front end, back end, database, you don't need it really just don't. It would be like having a postal service for a three person town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Be a little yeah, silly. Sounds like, sounds Let's like just a be neighborly. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but probably wouldn't work. <clears throat> but you get up to like 10, 15 services. Okay. Maybe look at how often are they changing? How often are you adding new ones? How often are you splitting? How often do you need to do some of the other things we've talked about? Um, do you, you know, how much overhead is there for you dealing with networking and security rules, securing uh, connections between them? It's when you start getting past that limit, when you start getting 30, 50, mm. hundreds of services, where now, again, whether you want to solve the problem that service mesh solves or not, you're going to be doing it. You're going to be doing all of these things we've talked about, and you're either going to be home baking it, which as an engineer is really fun until it's not. <laughs> <laughs> And when you come on and that engine and you, you've got to learn another engineer's way they did it, that that's how like there is an equivalent of a soap opera in context of tech. Oh my it, gosh. It is inheriting something like this, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So it works smarter, not harder. Right. So yeah. Yeah. So since you're going to be solving all those things anyways, once you get up to that, to that type of level, you know, security benefits aside, right. And the risk mitigation benefits aside, there's also the speed benefits that you're going to get of again, onboarding new services, onboarding new applications, allowing apps to run wherever they want. And of course, this is all going to lead to sort of a cost decrease, but you got to kind of, I would say, use the number of services and like how rapidly they change is the idea of in terms of when should I look at adopting one of them, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you're looking, I, I mean, how, I don't know how strictly you're throwing out these numbers of like 30 to 50, but yeah. um, is there a best practice for that or a recommendation or is it um, more yeah. of a judgment call? I would say it's more of a judgment call because if some of these, again, the, the type of service is going to largely depend upon when it is that you should, you should go about doing it. Right. Like the, if I'm trying to think here of, uh, if, if let's say you've got one set set service that's always changing, maybe that's like your your your, your very heavy user facing service, mm -hmm. but everything else is just sort of in place. <clears throat> maybe you've got payments that aren't going to move that much, and shipping services aren't going to move that much. And in general, the infrastructure changes you're going to be making are pretty minimal, right? In that type of case, 
is something like this going to be beneficial? It'll absolutely be beneficial. In fact, I'd say it's even still beneficial at a three-tiered application level if you plan to scale out. Um, sure. But where it will be infallibly and irrefutably valuable is going to go up with the more services you have. So if you're saying, so Cole, would you start with one then? Yes, because I like to over-engineer stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, that was going to be my next question is, is yeah. how... Um... How hardcore is this future proofing? And your example of, you know, if you have a three tiered app that you want to scale, I mean, is this overkill to, to future proof uh, in this way, you think? How how confident are you that this app's going to take off and be the next big thing? Everybody is confident, right? Exactly, <laughs> right? So <laughs> it's kind of one of those things where it's like you, you get you get that perspective as the engineer. You're like, well, I already know how to set this complicated thing up. I know I might need it in the future, so I may as well do it, right? Um, would I shift gears to do this though? Probably not. If you don't know it, if you're at a three-tiered application, if you're at a small handful of services that aren't gonna be changing a lot, if you're not sure that you have product market fit and whether or not that's gonna that go off, mm -hmm. um, yeah, if someone is, if they catch you setting this all up, they're probably gonna be like, maybe you should write the apps. Like, Use your time more yeah. wisely. <laughs> yeah. So. No, no, I think that's important because like you said, a lot of times we just learn a new concept or want to do things the perfect mm -hmm. way from the start. And that's not always the smartest yeah. thing to do. And I also want to say there's nothing wrong with the the, the different, the, the other methods. They do come with their own simplicity and benefits in their way because thinking about a service mesh does require you think differently. Um, but just putting an internal load balancer in front of every new set of services you have I mean, that's worked for a very long time. So it's not like it's going to let you down. You know what I mean? So Yeah, yeah. So somebody is listening to this podcast right now and they're like, man, I really need to set up a service mesh now. I'm yeah. inspired. Where would they go to get started? Or what's like the first couple steps? Or product? Yeah. yeah. No, number one, I'd ask what your run times are. That's, that seems silly. But if you tell me all contain, only containers, only Kubernetes, well, guess what? A lot, most of the service mesh options out there are for Kubernetes, right? So there's a lot mm -hmm. um, that'll, that'll solve that space. However, if you have multiple runtimes, so you're looking at a lot of different places, bare metal VMs and containers, that's when everything's gonna narrow down, in which case I'm gonna tell you to go check out HashiCorp console. And I'm oh. like, <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because that one, that one, that's what, that's what of course makes it special is its ability to work with these different runtimes and, mm -hmm. uh, and make it so that you can treat them all as one big network. Um, sure. So the reality to the second reality is that whichever one you pick, although this compass and mental model is the same, how you configure it is going to be different. Like it just, it just what, you know, whatever options that they have, what they call certain features, which what changes you need to necessarily make to the node or the runtime, or the application, those are gonna all vary somewhat. So um, unfortunately there's not some like unified path to learn the specifics of one. Um, uh -huh. Obviously understanding service mesh in general, hopefully we've kind of done that here, uh, but yeah. Well, in, in the case of HashiCorp service mesh, I feel like HashiCorp typically has decent guides and documentation. I don't know, at least in my experience. So, you know, if someone is looking at using HashiCorp service mesh, I, yeah. I'm guessing you guys have a getting started guide or something too. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you just go to our developer platform, which is just developer.hashicorp.com, we've got every single guide that you can think of, everything from the docs, the API docs, and then of course, uh, the actual step-by-step -step tutorials that'll show you all of the, the different ways to set it up from scale. And worst case scenario, if you decide you're not gonna use console, it does teach you all the fundamentals and concepts of service mesh in general as well. So you'll at least be able to take those and, uh, and use them elsewhere, so. Awesome. And I'm, and I'm not just to, just to kind of round out the conversation a little, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get, touch back on obstacles just in case we didn't already hit all of them, mm -hmm. but. Are there, you yeah. know, a million different service mesh types to choose from, or are there, you know, a few common types, you know, maybe uh, so not, people can kind of have that starting perspective? Yeah, there's actually not a, you know, it, I guess it depends on what you, you think is, is, is a lot. There's kind of like maybe 10 or more um, mid to large players. That you probably can, yeah, <laughs> that you probably consider. So you actually, you actually, because again, this the where service mesh becomes very critical is generally at a much larger scale right and as as a result um the the, the number of options i guess kind of go with that like how many yeah. people are running hundreds 200 300 services um so 
Yeah. Did that was that the answer to that question? Yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah. I mean, like I said, you're you're the expert here, so I'm I'm just uh, <laughs> riding the the river, the current. I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's finally just come back to the obstacle question. <laughs> I know that we hit on a lot of obstacles in the beginning, um, yeah. but are there other common obstacles to implementing a service mesh? And do you have recommendations for overcoming them? Yeah, I will say the number one difficulty for a service mesh is that initial getting it set up. That is, mm -hmm. I don't care which service mesh you pick, you pick any of them, it's gonna be a process. Not only because you're gonna have to deal with all just networking and security in general and making sure the applications can still all contact each other and dealing with the individual and perhaps very special and unique ways that your applications have come to communicate with each other as well. <laughs> All right, and then even after you set up the service mesh, re-implementing the different security controls and networking rules you want through it, as opposed to different ways, <clears throat> there's there's a lot of different setup that is required to get it uh, to, to get it started. Now, if you're coming coming from Greenfield, this really isn't going to be much of a problem because you can start. Yeah. Brownfield, hundreds of services. You know, it's not going to be. But instead of saying, "Hey, let's go all in," the reality is that start small, set up the service mesh, use it with a few at first. Oh, that's there's, a great recommendation. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of mechanisms in place, at least, uh, you know, I'm really not trying to sell anything here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but at least with the one that I'm familiar with, which surprise, surprise is console, um, that give you the ability to say, okay, you know what, we're going to allow you to treat all of these other services. We're going to be aware of them, but we're not going to force them into the mesh and you can slowly onboard them if you want them to. Right. Um, and I'm sure other meshes have, have thought about that as well, because adopting it is a process. So I would say set it up, use it limited at first, and just know that you can, of course, add on other things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one. Uh, and this sort of plays in. And the next one is application type. We kind of we kind of touched on this, which is the real time gaming type of, of example. Uh -huh. In a service mesh. It's not an all or nothing, which hopefully we just outlined in that previous option. Mm -hmm. You can opt, say, if you've got a store service, you know, social service, all these others, you can have those in the mesh and just tell them, hey, when you need to contact a specific game server, hop out of the mesh, just go directly to the thing <laughs> itself, right? Um, and as a result, you can kind of have uh, both of best worlds, but I would very much pay attention to what your application is doing, what its networking and latency requirements are. Um, and although real-time multiplayer gaming is an extreme example, obviously extremes kind of help us see, you know, learn a little bit in terms of what should yeah. be done and shouldn't. So. Can I just say I love your recommendation to, to baby step it too for, for uh, <laughs> large deployments because I, I think that's a, an issue we run into a lot in tech where we have all this technology that promises to make our life easier if only you're willing to make this upfront investment, <laughs> right? And it's like, oh, suddenly this doesn't feel like it's making my life easier. Oh so, yeah, yeah. This is the way to meet in the middle, right? Of you know the reality of the setup versus being completely mm -hmm. overwhelmed by it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's because again, you got to start thinking differently as well once you start putting in a, a a service mesh. But once you get through it, once you get it set up, right? You get that stride. That's when, uh, of course, it obviously starts showing its benefits uh, incredibly. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Cole, I have learned so much during this podcast episode. Uh, I know everyone else is going to be thrilled to see this when I publish it. I'm already excited before we even ended this call. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for for being willing to to really ride the roller coaster of the simple explanation to diving deep. And um, we want to promote some things of yours. So I know that you are representing, you know, HashiCorp. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got developer.hashicorp.com. I'm going to link that on the screen mm -hmm. as well as the HashiCorp website. That's where you can yeah. go to learn more about console, which is HashiCorp service mesh. Anything mm -hmm. else you'd like to share there? Yeah. Um, so obviously check me out. I've obviously put out a lot of content talks. I've actually got a really big service mesh talk that I did. Uh, at uh, one of our previous global conferences, where I actually show how to set up a big networking model between Kubernetes, Azure virtual machines, AWS ECS, all across these different cloud oh, providers yeah. in one in one place. Uh, just and obviously there's patterns there to set up with any type of different runtime. So it's a really neat way to see. Hey, you want to see how this goes uh, really big? So if you just check out my profiles and stuff, the, all those talks should be there. Um, and then like you said, developer hashicorp.com and hashicorp.com. And then I'd also say since this is a DevSecOps thing, 
check out uh, Vault in terms of uh, secrets management. Mm, yep. If you, yep. If you like what you've heard about Console, if you like Terraform, which hopefully everyone's heard of, then you probably like Vault. So. <laughs> and and those personal socials for you are going to be at J Cole Morrison. Uh, yep. Again, I'll put that on the screen. Um, got the blog start.jcolemorrison.com, mm -hmm. and of course you're on LinkedIn. Um, yep. Thank you so much again, Cole. Um, we'll end it here. Um, but thanks for being on. We had a great time. Thank you for having me.